Welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders from the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today is a special edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast series. This is one of our Hot Topics recordings where we aim to provide timely information to help patients, the general public, and healthcare professionals better understand a current popular topic. Today's episode will focus on how to manage seasonal allergies in the midst of our current global COVID-19 pandemic. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ann Ellis, who is a professor of medicine, chair of the Division of Allergy and Immunology, and the director of the Allergy Research Unit at the Kingston Health and Science Center in Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Dr. Ellis has extensive research experience investigating the impact of aeroallergen exposure, on inflammation as well as future development of allergic conditions. Dr. Ellis's novel Environmental Exposure Unit is an internationally recognized and validated controlled allergen challenge model of allergic rhinitis. She's made countless contributions to the field of allergy and immunology, including her current role on the Joint Task Force for Practice Parameters. Dr. Ellis, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule these days to join us today, and welcome to our show. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so right now we're recording this in early April 2020. We are in the midst of both a global COVID-19 pandemic and also spring pollen season, which is always a busy time of year for allergists and our patients. And my first question for you, how are you holding up? <laughs> well, fortunately, as you mentioned already, I'm in Kingston, Ontario, and we're, we've are we have a much slower start to our spring pollen season compared to uh, the southern U.S., so we're just barely getting started with those types of seasonal allergy symptoms now. Um, the uh, pollen forecast, obviously, for today, uh, I had to check it before I came uh, came online. It's uh, we're we're low to moderate on the trees that we know cause actual allergic symptoms, such as um, elder and uh, maple. But our only high counts are for juniper and cedar, which, as you know, don't actually re- result in much in the way of uh, allergic rhinitis symptoms. So happy to see that. And and so I personally, uh, I'm doing quite well under the circumstances. Obviously, following the guidance for for physical distancing, but I'm still coming in to, uh, to the hospital every day uh, to make sure that we're providing the high quality care for our patients that are required, although most of my outpatient uh, allergy clinics have obviously been uh, postponed. But I am oh. internal medicine um, trained, and so I'm here to help in the main hospital also. Wow. Yeah, so that was actually that leads into my second question. You know, as, as you mentioned, we, we have social distancing uh, that's been implemented essentially across the world at this point, uh, in, in an effort to try and limit the spread of this awful, awful pandemic co- caused by COVID-19. So you mentioned that your your outpatient visits have changed. Um, are you seeing patients in any realm, including like telemedicine or anything like that, or um, has that just been completely shut down at this point? Yeah, no, we've converted entirely to telemedicine. Um, our institution, we just activated our uh, virtual visit platform that's HIPAA compliant and PIPEDA compliant, so we'll be getting that up and running for actual e-visits with video functionality uh, this week, but because we wanted to make sure we were we were following the institution's recommendations and using something that had all the privacy considerations and the appropriate, uh, in, not encryption, but just security with the system, we were advised not to use Facebook or Skype or any of those other uh, sort of other alternative routes of, of doing uh, electronic medicine. So I've been doing lots of phone calls. Uh, I've been uh, <laughs> starting to have to, I had to retool my whole workstation because I realized the way in which I pick up the phone and, and talk, once you do that nonstop for a whole morning, um, I needed to, to do it a little bit of a reorg. I did my own self-occupational therapy adjustment. So, <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're doing lots of telemedicine. Um, and soon we'll be doing the electronic uh, visits for, for patients who do have the right equipment at home. Obviously, not everybody has internet or some people don't even have computers. So we're making sure we're providing uh, care to the patients that have been referred to me and that are my ongoing follow-ups um, through the virtual methods that have been approved by the Ontario government. Oh. 
So it sounds like you're you're rapidly adapting as as many of us are uh given the current climate here. And you know, it this the topic of today's podcast is seasonal allergies, but I'd love to hear your opinion. What are the aspects surrounding seasonal allergies and other allergic conditions that really make it um very amenable to these telephone or telemedicine visits? So particularly in people who have already been assessed, so they've already been in to see me and had their skin tests and I know what their relevant triggers are, a lot of what we do as allergists is is provide good advice Um, and we provide real information for our patients that's evidence-based. And so it's very easy, actually, for me to continue to advise patients on how to adjust their um, therapies for their allergies via by talking to them and getting a sense of how well controlled they were last year, how they're doing right now, and we can make those types of adjustments. Um, obviously, uh, those patients where we were maybe considering starting an immunotherapy, that's not been advised to start new patients on environmental immunotherapy, but we can make plans for next year. Um, Fortunately, uh, I mean, I have a lot of patients who are on sublingual immunotherapy, and and that's something they're taking at home, so they haven't had those treatments interrupted, which has been really helpful for for those patients. And, uh, yeah, the nice thing about allergy is we actually can do an awful lot over the phone, um, which is really nice as well. When I'm on call for consults to the hospital, um, I often don't have to come in. I can just give advice to the attending physicians uh, via telephone. Yeah, that's fantastic. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, I think that, and that's something I hope if there's any patients or the general public listening, you know, if you're not doing well, if you have questions or concerns that you're suffering, especially in the springtime with your pollen allergies, call your doctor, call your allergist. They can often make recommendations over the phone and we can continue to provide very high level care uh, while we all adjust to our current social restrictions. Um, so let's move on then. So you mentioned some of the different pollen types in your area, but give us a, a general overview. In the spring pollen season, what, what are the general types of pollen that are elevated during that time of the year? Absolutely. So right now we're just starting off in tree pollen season. Um, things like um, um, alder, um, birch, maple, and oak uh, will follow shortly thereafter. Um, we obviously have a lot of uh, pollen in the air that looks impressive but doesn't actually generate a lot of symptoms. So pine pollen, as you know, is, is this bright yellow uh, dusting on our cars each morning and everybody gets worried about how symptomatic they're going to be. In fact, that doesn't get resp- uh, inhaled very well because it is so heavy. It tends to fall to the ground and it doesn't end up in our mucosal system. So it's the wind pollinated, lighter pollens that uh, get blown around by the wind and those are the ones that cause symptoms. We also have a lot of seasonal molds out there. The mold spore count started to rise Two, is as far back as two to three weeks ago. Um, we have a lot of areas of snow mold, which is when you finally get that your, your snow thaws and you see those areas where your grass is all brown. That's due to the snow mold uh, damage through the course of the winter. So those are what we're facing right now. And typically in my neck of the woods, by the beginning of May, maybe middle of May, we'll start to hit grass season at that point. So again, um, Pollen counts and, and seasons are quite different across the country. Uh, for example, at the other opposite end of our country, British Columbia has had tree pollen since February. So it is important to recognize that the seasons are going to be different depending on where you live. Yeah, and, and you mentioned down south, like in Florida, I know the tree pollen has been elevated down there since January. Um, so it, it definitely varies based upon where you live. Now, you mentioned grass pollen will typically start in May or so, and I think this is what causes a lot of people to be confused. You know, we see trees outside all year, of course, and we see grass outside all year, but when the, you mentioned trees pollinating in the spring, when do we actually see pollen levels uh, increase in regards to things like grass and weeds and then ragweed? Yeah, so again, it, it's going to vary depending on where you are. The, I've, I've been told the grass season in Florida is, is eight months of the year, mm. um, whereas for those of us in these more northern uh, regions, as I mentioned, grass pollen will start sometime in May, peaking in June, and usually it dies down around July 15th, roughly, in our area. Then we have a little bit of a hiatus through the summer, a short one, but nevertheless a bit of a break. And ragweed, though, starts almost, you can almost set your clock to it, on August 15th uh, every year and continues through through to the first frost. And, and do you think that it's important for people who have persistent symptoms that require a lot of treatment, um, how does it help them to know exactly what they're allergic to? Well, because you can time your symptoms based on when the seasons are. So let's say, for example, you do have a lot of symptoms very first thing in the spring. Um, You might want to assume that it's due to tree pollen. But in fact, if you haven't been tested to find out, it could just be some of these seasonal molds that are causing your your issues. And if you are going to be pursuing something like immunotherapy as a treatment for your 
uh, hay fever symptoms or allergic rhinitis symptoms, it's important to know precisely what it is you're allergic to because that will change the formula we, we allergists will recommend uh, for managing your symptoms. Also, just because you have symptoms at a predictable time of year, you'd be surprised. I have a lot of patients that have referred to me for, you know, late summer, early fall, um, severe symptoms, and we are sure they're going to be ragweed allergic. And it turns out, no, it's just house dust mite because we know that house dust mite levels do get higher at times of high humidity. So while the medications that we use that just manage symptoms regardless of the underlying allergy, like antihistamines and nasal steroids, um, if you're going to embark on something that's more definitive, such as immunotherapy, it's really essential to see a, a board-certified allergist to get appropriate testing to determine what your relevant triggers are. So you can also mediate your home environment appropriately as well. Mm. And we're going to talk a bit about some of the medications and avoidance measures here in just a minute. But uh, I want to go back to something you mentioned at the, or at the outset of you know checking the, the pollen counts and pollen levels and things like that. Uh, can you walk us through, you know, how does something like the National Allergy Bureau uh, measure and report pollen levels? What do they actually do? So it depends on the location that, of where the sampling station is. Um, most of them use either what's called a rotor rod sampler, uh, where they have something that sits on the roof of a building, and the top of the device spins, and it has little, literally little plastic rods that are greased that collect pollen as it spins around. They get brought inside and they look at them under a microscope and count the number of pollen grains or mold spores that they see. Other locations use what's called a Burkhart spore trap. Um, but even though it's called a spore trap, it traps everything. So it puts everything onto a slide and then that's a 24 hour sampling process that they use to, to count the pollen. So there's a couple other devices on the market that could be used. So it varies a bit depending on the location, but the vast majority either use one of these spore traps or a rotor rod sampler. And the report that you get, is that showing you what's happening right that minute, or is it actually showing you something from the day before, for instance? That's a great point. No, it's always retrospective. We don't yet have any live streaming pollen counts of this second. Uh, it's based on yesterday's numbers. Mm. Oh, interesting. And in some I... cases, it may be based on last week's numbers, but most of the times when you see your pollen forecast on the Weather Channel, they'll have paid for the extra um, turnaround time, so that's based on yesterday's numbers. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's an important point, I think, for people to understand, because if it, you know, yesterday was dry and windy, but today is rainy, it could be a completely different situation. Totally different. Yeah, so it is a forecast, not um, not a complete fact, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. And, you know, if it's anything like our weather forecast, it only needs to be right, what, 30% of the time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so what about all these millions and millions of children and adults who suffer from seasonal allergies? What are some of the symptoms that they typically experience? So the common symptoms are things like sneezing, runny nose, itchy, watery eyes, nasal congestion. Sometimes people get post-nasal drip, that's sort of making you have a bit of a cough. Um, itching of the palate or throat can sometimes occur as well. Um, but really, those nasal symptoms are the hallmark features of seasonal allergic rhinitis. Yeah. And you know, every year, um, it seems like spring is the worst time of the year for allergies. Why is that so? Why Is that real? I think it's a perception based on the fact that you've been quiescent for the whole uh, lovely cold of the winter, and then when suddenly the, the symptoms start back up again because you're hitting, hitting the spring pollen season, um, it's just you've forgotten that, that this is the time, the types of symptoms you get year after year. So everybody says it feels like this is the worst season ever. In fact, when you look at the pollen counts, they're typically not that different from the last year. It's just you get that, you get that sort of you sort of forget about how your symptoms were when you had that nice long break through the cold, uh, snowy season. Gotcha. And those headlines that do proclaim, it seems like every single year, this is the worst allergy season ever. Uh, is there Are there data that show that we're actually seeing increasing pollen levels over time or longer pollen seasons? Or does it just seem like you said it's a more of a perception thing? So in some regions, there's been some data to suggest that uh, we are seeing perhaps not so much an earlier start to the pollen season, but uh, it tends to last a bit longer now. Um, some of the things that have been proposed to be secondary to climate change. Um, in my neck of the woods, uh, what we've noticed in the past few years is because we've had such a long winter and a short uh, time for when things ramp up, tree pollen season starts and almost instantly it's also grass pollen season. So you do get a bit of a double whammy if you're allergic to both types of, of, of both types of pollen. So that can make it seem like the worst season ever, quote unquote. Um, but again, it's, there's not yet a lot of hard data that seasons are actually having a higher peak or longer um, season on a globally stated scale. You can't sort of say that as a general statement, but there are pockets of, 
of the U.S. and Canada where there does seem to be some data to support a longer season and perhaps higher pollen levels, but it's not uniform. Mm. Now, going back to some of the symptoms you mentioned, you mentioned a lot of the nasal symptoms, and we know, we're, you know, as I mentioned, we're recording this in early April 2020, where we're in the midst of a global pandemic caused by COVID-19, uh, and that infection can also cause nasal symptoms and cough. So what tips do you have to help patients and clinicians differentiate between COVID-19 infection uh, versus seasonal allergies? So what I've really been emphasizing to my patients is that, yes, your hay fever symptoms will give you those nasal symptoms. You might get a bit of a cough from post-nasal drip, but that's very different from when you have a viral infection. Um, if you have a viral infection, you feel generally really unwell. You'll have a, you could have a fever. You may have a sore throat, um, muscle aches and pains. Those things typically don't happen just due to uh, seasonal allergies alone. Mm. And I know seasonal allergies are also called hay fever, but do allergies actually cause people to have a fever? No, it's an interesting uh, uh, challenge to try to uh, tease that out of people's mind. I mean, that's just the way the term was coined back in 1867 by Charles Blackley when he described it. Um, so, yeah, there's no fever associated with seasonal allergies. So that's a 150-year-old myth is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> you think we'd be able to do something about that, but... <laughs> It's such a no. common term, though, and it really does help. Um, it's interesting when, I, when I'm when i interviewing a brand-new patient for the first time, if I say, do you have seasonal allergies or do you get you know allergic rhinitis, there's always no, no. And then I say, well, do you ever get hay fever symptoms? Oh, yeah, every spring. So it, it is a recognizable term. So it's one of the things that might be harder to undo, but certainly patients do identify with it, and they recognize what that means. Oh, that's fascinating. Um, well, let's talk about medications and treatment. So what are the different types of medications that are typically used to treat seasonal allergies? So first line is over-the-counter uh, second-generation antihistamines, and by that I mean the ones that do not cause sedation. It's important to recognize that first-generation or older sedating antihistamines are no longer recommended uh, for use in this population. Uh, these medications are associated with a fairly significant side effect profile, and the newer agents uh, such as and I don't want to name too many names because obviously there are differences across the border, but I think we both have loratadine, we both have fexofenadine, uh, claritin, and allegra respectively. Um, you have a different name for, for cetirazine than we do, so it's Zyrtec in the States and, and Reactin in Canada. But again, these uh, non-sedating antihistamines, uh, all of them are available over the counter, but it is important that you get one that says non-drowsy because uh, older generation agents like uh, diphenhydramine or everybody knows the name Benadryl, um, unfortunately, their side effect profile outweighs the benefits of, of the antihistamine properties, so often we do strongly recommend people use the non-sedating uh, agents. When people fail um, antihistamines, we usually would then recommend a nasal steroid. And again, both on both sides of the border, there are a couple options available for nasal corticosteroids that you can just buy over the counter as, with, as opposed to needing a prescription. The main thing to recognize with these agents is that they do need to be used daily uh, for several days to weeks, usually months at a time, to maintain their, their best benefit. Um, so they don't work with one spray. You have to use them every day or you won't get the benefit from them that they're designed to deliver. For people who fail those over-the-counter options, there are prescription versions of the nasal steroids. Uh, there's a prescription uh, nasal steroid antihistamine combination, which some people uh, derive great benefit from. And then, of course, we recommend for all patients with persistent symptoms that are now sort of moderate to severe and you're needing lots of therapies, perhaps it's good at that point to see a board-certified allergist for uh, specialist testing so you can find out what it is you're actually allergic to and perhaps consider immunotherapy. And, you know, we know that there are millions and millions of people that suffer from seasonal allergies, but it sounds like from you that a lot of folks can really just start with the, the first-line therapies, try an antihistamine, nasal steroid, and then if they're not seeing the relief that they want, that's when we can consider additional treatment or, or testing. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I would say so, particularly given that, you know, we the, the, the access to allergists uh, is going to vary depending on your, your region. Definitely make sure you're at least trying some of those uh, safe and effective over-the-counter um, agents first, but don't hesitate to to let your primary care provider know if they're not doing the trick. Don't suffer in silence. You know, by all means, in indicate that you're having trouble and you want to have uh, some additional help from an allergist. Yeah. Now, when it comes to those those two main categories of the antihistamines and the nasal steroid sprays, do they work the same? Do they have the same efficacy? Do they treat the same symptoms? 
So it's an interesting point. They all have indications for both seasonal and perennial, in other words, year-round allergic rhinitis symptoms. Um, the onset of action from an antihistamine is typically faster than with a nasal steroid spray. As I mentioned, you need to be on it for several days before you really start to feel the benefit. Um, some antihistamines are not quite as good at relieving nasal congestion as a nasal steroid would. Um, so that's often something we'll make sure that we ensure that patients with prominent nasal congestion get on a nasal steroid. Um, obviously, there are over-the-counter combination therapies where you have an antihistamine paired with a decongestant in an oral tablet. Um, but typically, those medications can be an issue for people who have high blood pressure. So we don't want people using those long term. Uh, so it is better to stick with just the monotherapy with the antihistamines if you can get away with it. Um, and the other thing, again, I think the important thing to realize is don't expect immediate relief from one spray of, an, of a nasal steroid. You do have to use it daily to get your best benefits. Any tips on how to get people to remember to use their nasal steroids every day? <laughs> so the same sort of tips that I use uh, with my asthmatics, quite frankly, to make sure they remember to use their inhaled corticosteroids is keep it in the bathroom next to your toothbrush. Uh, build it into your morning routine. Uh, most of these agents are just once a day, uh, so you just have to make it, remember to use it once a day. Uh, two sprays in each nostril once daily is, is almost all of them are formulated that way, um, with the odd exception. So obviously your doctor will talk to you about that, but most of them are just once a day, and so you just have to make it part of your while well, you're just after you brush your teeth, take your nasal spray. If you need to, take your antihistamine tablet, and uh, then you're covered for the rest of the day. Oh, excellent. And if they don't brush their teeth every day, then they have other problems to worry about. So Correct. Get the yeah. nasal spray. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about some of these nose sprays? It, you know, there's tons of nose sprays. You go to the pharmacy and you see shelf after shelf. What about, you know, the, the, a common trade name um, is Afrin. Uh, how is that different from a nasal steroid? Is that something that I didn't hear you mention that? Should people with seasonal allergies be using something like that? That's a great point. No, is Afrin oxymetazoline? Uh, I believe so. Okay, just because we don't have that particular brand name ah. in Canada. So, um, but yes, so things like Afrin or Dristan nasal spray, uh, they really are not ideal medications for patients with um, allergic rhinitis. Uh, the problem with these agents is, is that your nose actually does become dependent on them. They give you that immediate uh, decongestant effect and you feel great and you think it's wonderful. But the problem is, is the next time you use it, it doesn't work quite as well. And the time after that, it works less well. Um, and so it, to the to the point where some patients actually get to the stage where they've used so much of it, they uh, they can't even they can never get any relief at all. So you get sort of a what we call tachyphylaxis, where the the medication stops working and and your nose can actually quote unquote become dependent on it. So it is important to if you are going to use something like Afrin or or Dristan nasal mist that you're using it for no more than 24 to 48 hours for just some acute immediate relief, but you're not using it on a daily basis. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't mention it, is because we really don't want people yeah. using it uh, throughout the entire season. Yeah, excellent. Now, I want to go back to something you mentioned um, just a minute ago about the importance of the difference between first-generation antihistamines and second-generation. And you were part of a work group in Canada that developed a recent position statement discussing the harm of these first-generation antihistamines. Just to reemphasize, can you explain the main points in this document and why it was necessary? Absolutely, because the, the, the fact is, the matter is, is that these drugs have actually more side effects than they have effects, if you will. Um, they are they very easily cross what's called the blood-brain barrier and lead to side effects and then bind to antihistamine, sorry, histamine receptors in the, literally in the brain, leading to things like uh, sedation, um, dry mouth, impaired cognition, decreased memory formation. Um, they really do impair mental functioning, even if you don't feel sedated. Um, it's important to recognize that you can take one and say, well, I, I've slept fine, um, but in fact, you're not, you're not getting a restful uh, sleep. You're, getting a, you're missing out on REM sleep, so you actually wake up more groggy the next day, even if you don't realize it. They've done um, driving tests from people who have taken these first-generation agents, and even though they don't report being sedated, they don't perform as well on a driving test that somebody has been given a second-generation non-sedating antihistamine. So yes, we made, thought it was important to, to get put pen to paper and, and release this position statement. We 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 are lo currently lobbying Health Canada to move these agents behind the counter, so that you have to have a conversation with your pharmacist to understand the risks as, and benefits of these medications before you choose them. Um, obviously, Health Canada is distracted by COVID like everybody else right now, so we we imagine that that uh, um, application has been somewhat shelved. But we'll continue to 
to uh, advocate for our patients and make sure they realize the importance of, of avoiding these medications where possible. There's an excellent study from the UK that showed if some, a child has uh, seasonal allergies, we know that they won't perform as well on their, on their tests, um, but their grade drops even further if they take a sedating antihistamine to treat uh, their symptoms before they write their tests. So uh, I really do jump up and down with parents to make sure they're using only uh, non-sedating agents. Wow, that's a, that's a really big deal. And I'm glad that you wrote the paper. I know it generated a ton of headlines across the world, uh, and rightly so. Now, what about non-medication therapies? What can people do if they don't want to take or, or can't tolerate certain medications for whatever reason to help treat their seasonal allergy symptoms? Yeah, so saline rinses is a great uh, non-medical option. Um, again, it is, it is important to, to purchase the ones that are available by the pharmacy rather than making your homemade um, sterile nasal saline solutions at home. We've had some issues with them not actually being so sterile after all. Um, but again, just that saline rinse to help wash away mucus and clear out your sinuses. Uh, can be very beneficial and, and produce a lot of relief for patients. And there's no upper limit to them. We usually say up to six times a day those can be used if you can actually find the time to do that. Uh, but that's one uh, non-medical option I recommend for everyone. Um, the other thing, of course, is, is whatever avoidance strategies can be put in place. I'll, I'll talk to my patients about those things. So uh, for patients with dust mite allergy, we have uh, high-quality dust mite impermeable covers that do reduce your exposure to the dust mite allergen while you're sleeping, um, things like keeping your windows closed and your air conditioning on uh, when you're in the pollen season can help minimize your exposure. Um, obviously, at some point, you are going to go have to outside, so it's not it's not perfect, but these things do uh, help to a certain extent. Um, if, you, if you have allergies that are due to a cat or a dog um, and you live with one, we generally recommend trying to find a new home for, for that animal, recognizing that they, that usually doesn't end up happening. So in that case, then, you know, washing the uh, the cat, the animal once a week, um, restricting them so they don't have access to the bedroom, things like that can make a bit of a difference. And um, what about for the, the outdoor pollen allergies? You mentioned with the air conditioning and windows, anything, any other steps they can do after they've been outside? I mean, some people, you know, they have to mow the lawn or, you know, we don't want to keep people inside for months at a time. So what other, what other steps can they take? So if you, one thing that seems sort of obvious is that when you've been mowing the grass or you've been outside for a, a period of time, uh, probably you've got a bit of pollen on your hair and in your on your clothes. So um, changing those clothes, maybe have a fast shower to help put those and to change into a fresh set of clothing and put those pollinated clothes somewhere else uh, can be helpful. Um, I know lots of people like to hang their laundry on the line, but again, during to, to let to, uh, you know not to cut down on dryer use and things like that. But unfortunately, when you do that, uh, pollen is going to land on your clothes, and so you're going to re uh, repollinate yourself when you go to get dressed in the morning. Um, so things like that can help. Um, the there are nasal filters being sold online. I don't think they're widely being used, but those are also things that uh, have been tried with some degree of success, um, but it's a bit awkward. It's something you actually shove in your nose to try to block the pollen from being inhaled mm. through the nose. You know, everybody's wearing masks right now because of COVID-19. <laughs> um, do those masks actually help with, with things like tree pollen? That's a great question. I've never actually thought of it. I would imagine uh, that, yeah, if, if it's a barrier for, I mean, we know that those little paper masks that most people are walking around in aren't actually going to be effective in, in stopping the transmission of covid um, but I would imagine it's a nice physical barrier uh, from from the pollen as well. Um, yeah, one more barrier. It wouldn't help your eyes, of course, unless you walked around with a mask on your eyes too. But <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. um, you you mentioned before about immunotherapy. Uh, walk us through what, what does immunotherapy actually do, um, and you know what does that entail? What what's the practical utilization of that? Yeah, so immunotherapy is the only thing that actually changes your underlying immune system and targets trying to actually reduce your reactivity to um, these allergens you're sensitized to. The antihistamines, the nasal steroids, they help to reduce the symptoms, but they don't do anything for the underlying disease. The goal of immunotherapy is to actually induce a shift in your immune response from one that's allergic, where you get all the symptoms you're currently experiencing, to one that's more tolerant, so that you're able to inhale your allergens and tolerate them better. Everybody's response rates are a little bit different, but for the most part, most of my patients have derived great benefit from going through the process of immunotherapy. There's two different ways this can be achieved. One, or the more traditional route, is a subcutaneous or immunotherapy or so-called allergy shots. 
where patients will receive a series of weekly injections over the course of approximately six months. Again, every practice is slightly different, but you're gradually increasing the dose week after week after week until you hit what's called the so-called maintenance dose, where we've included in it the, the levels of major allergen that we know from clinical trials have shown to produce a meaningful, meaningful uh, clinically important improvement in your symptoms. And we continue you with, on that maintenance dose for approximately three to five years to induce long-term remission of symptoms. The other way this can be given now and with increasing number of allergens being available is a sublingual immunotherapy tablet. These are approved by both Health Canada and the FDA and are available currently to treat uh, symptoms of house dust mite, uh, grass, and ragweed allergy, and soon to come a tree tablet. And the advantage of this product is the first dose has to be given in the doctor's office. Then you continue to take it though at home, a tablet that just dissolves under your tongue every day and usually you take it either for four months prior to the season and then throughout the season, or in the case of the dust mite tablet, you take it year-round. Um, whereas with the allergy shots or subcutaneous immunotherapy, because it has a risk of anaphylaxis, we make sure people are getting these in a doctor's office and they're being watched for half an hour. So a little bit less convenient, um, but does have the advantage of you can put all of the allergens that you need to be uh, desensitized to together in the injection, whereas the tablets, it's one tablet, one allergen. So you're either taking three tablets to get the ones that are all being available right now, or again, it just only treats one allergen at a time. And, and speaking of the allergy shots uh, that are given in the office setting, given that we're in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic with increased risk for infection and, and guidelines for social distancing, and also in the middle of you know spring pollen season, and the reason that people would get allergy shots is because they have severe seasonal allergy symptoms. Uh, what are some of the considerations that allergists need to, con need to think about uh, if they administer allergy shots in their office, as well as the patients who receive them uh, during these really trying times? That's a great, great question, and it's something that, you know, we get, it's interesting It's interesting when you ask an allergist an opinion about anything, we, we, you'll never get the same answer from the same person, <laughs> uh, from a different person, but generally speaking, the vast majority of the allergists that I've been speaking to have either decided on balance of, of risk versus benefit, we're just going to not give environmental injections at all, we're only going to continue with our venom immunotherapy injections. However, for some patients, that's actually... Um, and they would much rather, under safe practices, continue to receive their immunotherapy injections because if you stop for a prolonged period of time, and, and right now with COVID-19, this isn't something that's going to go away in the next week or so. Um, if you're off them for a, a reasonable amount of time, like with the time we're expecting this pandemic to continue to in, in, impart on us the social distancing rules, all of those people who stop will probably have to restart again right at the very beginning and they're back on weekly for six months. So we've implemented the shared decision making uh, protocol within our hospital immunotherapy injection clinic whereby, I mean, obviously the patient has to be feeling well. So if the patient has a fever, cough, new sore throat, has traveled outside the country in the last 14 days, it's a no-go. They're not coming in. So we want to make sure that they're, they're healthy and well if they're going to come in themselves. Um, obviously we make sure everybody working in our clinic uh, meets those same criteria. And then I literally have run through every single patient in my practice who's on immunotherapy. And I say, if you're comfortable coming in and you're feeling well, I'm happy to give you your injection. If, on the other hand, you feel uncomfortable, that's fine too. This is your judgment call. You know what you're comfortable with in terms of your risk benefit uh, tolerance. Um, whereas there are other areas I'm aware of that have been much more sort of heavy handed and just said, no, we're just not going to offer those at this time. So I think you have to reflect on your regional um, guidelines and policies, and that's probably going to vary even state to state, practice to practice, uh, province to province, uh, doctor to doctor, even in Canada. So it is, uh, again, this is just what I'm doing, um, but I'm also aware there's others that are doing something very different. So. Oh, thank you for, for that. I, I agree with you. It's not one size fits all. Flexibility absolutely matters. Uh, it's an evolving situation. Shared decision making is important. And I would like to direct all listeners who are interested in learning more, especially from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. There's wonderful resources on the website landing page, which takes you to the COVID-19 um, section of the website, where there's a whole host of information, including a white paper on preparedness, uh, which is actually now a publication on preparedness that specifically addresses this topic. So uh, we'll direct all listeners there. We'll put this in the show notes as well. Um, now, Dr. Ellis, you're very active on social media, uh, as I am, and I think you do a great job of providing evidence-based information like you have on our podcast uh, surrounding allergies 
And your your Twitter account is very active, and you're at Dr. Ann Ellis. Uh, Correct, Ann with Ellis, an E. With an E. Um, what are some of the common misconceptions and myths that you either see online or hear from patients regarding seasonal allergies? So one of the most common things I see, and I know you tweeted about this recently as well, Dave, is that um, you know things like local honey can help mm. um, cure your seasonal allergies. Uh, unfortunately, uh, honey tastes good and it's a yummy treat, but there's no evidence to support that that actually has any uh, medicinal effects towards seasonal allergies, except for um, if you've been coughing so much from your post-nasal drip, now you have a bit of a sore throat, it can provide some relief from that perhaps. Um, but so that, that I come across a lot. Um, again, the, the belief that um, Benadryl is better um, as an antihistamine, I, I sort of combat that myth a lot as well. Uh, it's not better, it's, it's an effective antihistamine, but it isn't necessarily better than any of the newer ones, and in fact does carry the side effect profile that we discussed earlier. Um, I think the other thing is that there's this belief that, well, that, well there's nothing to be done. Take a mm -hmm. take a cetirizine and, and go off with you. There's nothing more you can do for allergies. And what yet we know if you if you are lucky enough to convince your primary care provider to send you to an allergist, we have lots of options that we can do to help people feel better. And uh, there's no there's no such thing as uh, there's nothing we can do in the set in the setting of seasonal allergies. Oh, that's great. You know, as we wrap up, and I can't thank you enough for all the time you spent with us in the middle of everything that's going on right now, but I'd really love to hear more about your fascinating environmental exposure unit. What happens inside there? So obviously it's it's on hold because now is not a oh, good time yeah. to um, <laughs> inducing allergic rhinitis symptoms uh, when, and getting people to sneeze and cough all over each other. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the environmental exposure unit is a, is a specially designed uh, system and it's located right in the hospital itself. Um, it's been it's specifically engineered to circulate controlled levels of aeroallergen. Uh, we are validated for grass, uh, ragweed, and birch. And we have a smaller facility that we've validated for house dust mite. Uh, I was going to be presenting that data at uh, the Quad AI, but obviously now that's being pre presented virtually online. Um, so we're able to study people with those types of allergies. And the large unit seats up to 120 participants simultaneously. So we can circulate controlled levels of aeroallergen in a circumstance where we've got also have control over the temperature, the humidity, the CO2 levels to make sure that it's the optimal conditions for pollen dispersal. And also we can keep it in, the, in a temperature range that's comfortable for participants. And we induce symptoms of allergic rhinitis and we can use that model to test new therapies for allergic rhinitis, whether they be symptomatic treatments like a, an antihistamine or a nasal steroid, or more increasingly I'm doing studies where we're do, checking to make sure people are actually clinically reactive to something they have a positive skin test to, and then we treat them with a new immunotherapy and then bring them back and see how much we've reduced their symptomatic responses, uh, either compared to baseline or compared to a placebo control. And the vast majority are, do in fact involve a placebo control arm because seasonal allergic rhinitis is a bit of a subjective disease. But this, uh, this unit's been up and running since the late 1980s. It was uh, initially developed by my predecessor, Dr. James Day, and a colleague of his from the uh, Department of Engineering here at Queen's University. And uh, they moved it over to the hospital in the early 90s. And I've been involved in studies with the environmental exposure unit since I was a first year medical student back in 1995 and uh, have c carried on uh, running trials ever since. Wow, that's amazing. How long do people sit in there for? Does it vary based upon the allergen in the study? or Absolutely. It depends on that? the design of the study and what it is that we're investigating. So for something like an antihistamine trial, typically you'd have two hours to get your symptoms sort of up and running. We would then dose the patients and then follow them for the next sort of three to four hours afterwards to look for the onset of action. Obviously, in the setting of a nasal uh, steroid, uh, if you're looking for onset of action, we've had trials where they've had to continue their exposure for 14 hours total. Um, but most of our studies involve a three to five hour uh, uh, challenge. We allow people to, if they're comfortable bringing devices in and they don't mind the fact that you're going to have to clean the pollen off your uh, keyboard <clears throat> when you leave, um, they can bring in their laptop, they can do any seated activity. Uh, we also do show movies and we make sure if, we're, if the protocol allows us, we feed them good food. Um, so we do, do our best to make the time in, in the exposure unit as, as enjoyable as possible, uh, despite the fact you will be having some, some hay fever symptoms while you're with us. 
<laughs> that's that's just so fascinating. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's that's, that's truly amazing. Uh, well, Dr. Ellis, you know your time is valuable, and this has been extremely beneficial. We covered a lot of territory, but um, your explanation of, of things was, was spot on, and I know a lot of people are going to benefit from it. But before we depart, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to share? I'm going to end with what I typically always do with any interview I, I have around seasonal allergies or, or allergic rhinitis in general, and that just to, for people to recognize that, you know, this is not a sneeze and sniffle, ho-hum disease. This this disease carries a huge quality of life burden for for a lot of patients who suffer from it. It's the, it's the number one reason for, for school and work absence or at least presenteeism in the workplace. Um, so don't be afraid to to seek out an allergist and get relief. That's great. Thank you. We hope today's episode was helpful. Please visit www.aaaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.